Say that's, something. That's a mighty Not pretty a picture. Damn you got there. thing. <laughs> there we uh, go. Now I can hear you. Now you can hear me. Yes, and your voice is actually not booming in my ears. Well, I can't really see your video. That's probably because I turned it a, turned this back on and the video didn't enable. <laughs> I don't know why it's default is not to turn on the video, but as he crashes the whole fucking thing again. <laughs> Howdy, folks, and welcome to episode five hundred and sixty-one of the Dev Robot Society. I'm Paul E. Cooley, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Terry Mixon. How are you, Mr. Mixon? They can't see. They can't hear that dude. They can't hear my jazz hands. They can't hear your jazz hands. You have to actually speak. Oh man! I mean, I know we're recording this for video at the same time, so that some schmucks can go watch us on 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 the YouTube's, but they can't hear you on the podcast. It's a problem. Well, damn it, Jim. So you know you're gonna have to quit your mime routine. Oh, I refuse. Mimes are cool. Not in my books. Uh... <laughs> so what's up in your world, man? I'm writing a novella. That's right. End of Empire. That's right. I said I was going to start it last week, and I am more than halfway done with it. I think I'm twelve or 13,000 words into a targeted 25,000. Wow. You've been busy, man. You must I have been be busy. kicking ass. The last two days, because Donna had her uh, lap band removal surgery on Monday, and we had doctor's appointments today, and uh, yesterday and today, uh, I've just hit my minimum word count of 300 for both of the previous days. So that 12,000 words is basically in five days. Yeah, so I'm pretty pleased with that. I haven't hit a word count in a while, <laughs> which is very fucking unfortunate. Um I should have the no, I should have the novella finished draft wise by the time we record the next show. Are That's you my target. Wow. Coolness. Yeah. Now I still have to do the self editing that goes along with it, but I'll have the draft finished. Well, that's cool. That's awesome. So it's going along nicely. I've, I've targeted ten chapters, and I'm in. I'm halfway through chapter six. So even if it spreads out to eleven or twelve chapters. It's still going to be a, a nice little story. Cool. It's from a different point of view of anybody else, so it's always hard to get started figuring out what you're going to do with a new character as the point of view. Well, you've also got like a thousand years of culture differences too, right? It happens about 500 years previous to Empire of Bones, back when the Empire fell. Right. So... Yeah. There are some differences, but as, as a novella, I'm not really digging into them too deep. Okay. The story is about Lucian's journey from being the heir of the Terran Empire to get to Avalon at the end of basically the fight there. That's my story arc. Okay. Yeah, you've talked about this a few times over the mm -hmm. past several years, so that's cool. That story is going to end up being a, a reader magnet. I'll probably still put it out for sale, but it's mainly, it's not going to be in Kindle Unlimited because I intend to give it away to people that are, that I lure into my mailing list once I get that restructured the way I want it. Once you lure them in. I, I just don't know about this. It sounds, it's all sounds very unethical to me, this marketing thing. How many people do you have on your mailing list? Oh, how many real people? Unknown. Oh, wait. Let's leave out the Chinese bots here. <laughs> Probably, I don't know, 150, 200 now? I've got 3,300. Yeah. And I want 10,000. But, you know, I'll be satisfied with whatever I get. As long as I can keep growing my list organically, it's a good thing. And this is one way to bring people that may not have heard of my work into reading something. Mm -hmm. If I had control over any of my popular properties, I would probably be doing the same. As an aside, I remember seeing something a few days ago that uh, Jake Bible has got back his dead mech stuff and mm -hmm. is now publishing it. Mm -hmm. 
is it hit he hit the rights termination expiration. So yeah, you should be coming up soon. A couple of years. Uh, it's next year for the black. I think it's next year for the black. Um. Yeah, it's kind of frightening, isn't it? It's been out that long, along with Outbreak and all the other mess. Where does the time go? Anyway, uh, I have not been up to much writing. I have done some outlining. I have done some wild note-taking while I was looking, looking at some things. I just need to be able to sit down and actually write them. But uh, Plotting while using magic mushrooms is never a good idea. What are you talking about, man? It works for it, it works fine with DMT. Anyway, hey man, <laughs> just like lay off, man. So with that in mind, I still have a lot of work to do on Signal Decay and uh, Trident, but I'm hoping to get back to that. I keep saying that in November. I have a deadline on 31st. I have deadline on uh, next week and. Y'all won't see this. By the time you see this episode, it's all over. I'm going to bet. Here, here we are. I'm going to put my prognostication on the table and slap my Karnak the Magnificent hat on and say that we are going to be slightly late recording next week's episode. I'm going to put on my prognostication hat and say you're right. So, no, when, when this comes out, it'll actually, this this intro will come out with it, with today's episode. So, they will see this. By the time next episode rolls around... <laughs> Probably all my shit will be either exploded or in good shape. We'll see. One other thing that uh, I had going on is the audio version of Blood of Patriots, book four in the Humanity Unlimited saga, is out and available. Yay! Yay! More Veronica Jaguar goodness for your ear holes. I don't know why you use that hack. Jeez. That's terrible. That's terrible. She's going to cut you off and I'm going to laugh. Yeah, she probably is. She's she's sharpening her knives for next year's Balticon. That's what she's doing. Anyway, we have you No, know, she may show you a costume. Yeah, maybe. We we have one more episode before the infamous appendix episode. Uh so I, <laughs> you have me bursting with curiosity. Oh my god, that's so septic. All right, so uh <laughs> now that we're done with the dad jokes. Let, I don't even know what this is about. Something to do with culture changes. There's no telling how completely sleep deprived I was for be, this. Be fair to the reader. This is the second catch up episode where we basically hit every part of the map we could reach. Yeah, I think I think sleep deprivation was involved. Anyway, here it is. So, what do you know, man? I know that I've finally written enough sequentially that I'm feeling in the groove of writing every day. So I'm in the good mental space of, of producing every day. That's a start. It is indeed. I'm at 75,000 words. So I'm roughly 20,000 words away from wrapping up the novel. Oh, cool. I don't think that I'll finish it before we record next, but two weeks I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful by the end of this month, the draft will be done. That would be awesome. It's you been would... too long for this damn draft, so I'm ready. <laughs> I know how that goes. All too well, actually. All too freaking well. Then I'm sitting there going, all right, and then when I finish that, do I just want to read through it or do I want to print it out and go over the paper? Like bouncing back and forth of what I want to do. Eh. But it's only getting one. It's only getting one, God damn it! I'm only doing one of those two. Because <laughs> hmm. it took me two weeks to go through a novel doing the redlining and then doing another read-through. I don't intend to do that again. I still have to figure out for Trident um, where the stopping point is going to be. Yeah, that's dangerous. Um, oh, by the way, I'm 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 gonna clap here because if I don't tell you this now, I'm gonna forget about it. All right, clap. The, the patrons do not need to know about this. Okay. Meanwhile, 
on episode 775,000 of, of DRS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> We've got broken water pipes up here in the woodlands. Uh, they don't know what's going on, but this is like the third, fourth time that the San Jack River Authority was all the stuff the Woodlands, you know, paid them to put in. We've had four breaks that basically swallowed roads. So they're talking about these were made out of PVC pipe. And something is obviously happening to the PVC pipe. So I was like, they're going to go down there and they're going to take an intact section out and have it analyzed. I'm sitting there going, do I really want to know what's eating the PVC pipe? <laughs> do I you really want to know? a robot. I've got this robot. Oh, God. No. No. Not yet. Not yet. But soon. Relatively speaking. If we can get through the demo. If. When. How. Who knows. They fucked us. That's all you need to know. Sorry to hear that, sport. Mm-hmm. That's all we know. Is they fucked us. Eh, is what it is. Uh, I wasn't kidding about not being able to figure out when to cut Trident off. I didn't figure you were, but you really need to find a spot because if you drag it on too long, you're going to be like the Terra Gambit and you'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to have to stop the damn book here. <laughs> Don't well, do that. Don't be Terry. It's, it's a matter of figuring out what I actually need to have happen in shipyards. And I think the way to end Trident is... Now you froze. You twitched a bit. We have some weather coming in. We're supposed to be under a deluge later this evening and tomorrow, I think. The sky's been drooly all day today. Yeah, it has. Hasn't helped me stay awake. <laughs> Look, although I think I I think I'm in in uh, deserving of a couple of extra naps here and there because wow. I just do not recover like I used to. After we talked last time, I, I was looking up at the screen here and seeing the, the chat dates for when we were as, last recorded. And it reminds me that right after I got off the show talking with you, we, we talked about cheesy old science fiction. Yeah, and then you put up uh, uh, Space 1999. I did, because somehow I found a, a reference to that on Facebook. And amusingly enough, September 13th, 1999 is when the moon was blown out of orbit. So oh, wow. 20, year, 20 years to the day after or before or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> when we were talking about cheesy science fiction. So it was perfect. I so love I that. I, I love that show when I was a kid. I watched the first episode again. Because it was on YouTube. <coughs> I and my God, they had bell-bottom uniforms. <laughs> oh, yeah. They could it was. all... It was good shit. They could have all gone to a disco. It was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. Uh, but it was... Oh, the theme music to it. I'm like, going through the theme music, and there was lots of boom. I'm like, oh, my God. It's like a porno movie almost. <laughs> yeah, there were some scenes like that. I think my favorite episode is when one of the eagles got melted. I can't remember. They lost the rest. a couple here in this episode. I mean, blown up, crashed. All yeah, I was like, where do they keep getting these fucking things from? <laughs> Just sound like a massive eagle producing facility. They, uh, they never answered that not, question. But, yeah. What are they printing? They're printing uh, uh, eagles in the back of the ship. And we're never seeing that go on on the station. My my thing that I thought was just really fun was. You knew even going into the episode, oh, it's all this this radiation. It's it's all the the nuclear waste that's buried on the moon is causing all these people to die. But we're not detecting any radiation, so they're looking around. Wait, it's magnetic radiation. There is no such thing as magnetic radiation, you losers. That's not true. There's magnetic fields. There is not magnetic radiation. Yes, there is. Electro uh -oh. electromagnetic whoop, whoop, radiation. Whoop. A 
A kind of radiation including visible light, radio waves, gamma rays, and x-rays in which electric and magnetic fields vary simultaneously. See, but there's regular radiation along with it. It's there's, no just weird, there's no just weird magnetic radiation all by itself. Probably not, no. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, no, no, this would be detectable. If, if you're being nuked by any kind of radiation, there would be regular radiation going along with it, or the damn hills would be glowing. Come on now, sports. They're on the moon. Who cares? But in any case, the hills are alive in, with the feel of CZ 1975. So you, you've got to give it a little, a little space there. <laughs> if you'll forgive the term special radiation, radiation, you've never heard of mere mortals. And it accelerated the moon at God only knows how many gravities. I was tempted to go ahead and figure out how much thrust it would require to accelerate the moon <laughs> So fast it would pin them to the ground and they couldn't do anything. And and how long would it have to accelerate at that speed? Even if it accelerated for the entire length of time that was going on in the movie, it would not get you anywhere. <laughs> not if they were gonna to live. The system. Not if not, they were gonna live. It could accelerate it. Let's let's say it accelerated at <laughs> ten gravities, ten whole gravities where no one would be conscious when they're doing it. It was running for, we'll say, two or three minutes in the show. We could say it was running for an hour or two. That would still not even get it up to a significant fraction of the speed of light. No. No, no, Visit no. Visit other solar systems? Yeah, no, not happening. No, not happening. You're going to need space warps or something to make that work. <laughs> I can't even remember what the... Was that the conceit? They buried nuclear waste up there? Yes. That was the conceit. And it exploded and thrust the moon out of Earth's orbit and into space where it wandered from solar system to solar system so they could visit other places. Sounds to me like they they, they should have gone with the uh, uh, the nukes exploded, created some kind of time universe thing, and that that's more believable. <laughs> it accelerated the moon that fast. Of course, as a kid, you know, um, as a kid, you I don't did, give a shit. I didn't I didn't care about it. But even as a kid, I was like, I don't think it was going that fast. I think there's something wrong here. I do not think that means what you think it means. But even so, one of the other things that I did a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to reach over here and grab it here. I ordered a book because somebody was talking about old science fiction books. And I was like. We were talking about Conan and, and other things. And they, they talked about Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of that as well. And I remembered a slightly more offbeat series by John Norman uh, called Gore, which was basically there's another Earth on the other side of the sun from where we are orbiting at the same time around the sun. So we never see it, but it's over there. And this guy goes back and forth between it. And just like every piece of fiction from back in that era, it has serious flaws with things that you could not get away with writing these days. <laughs> and um, the way it treats women is unacceptable, yet it is our history as far as this type of pulp fiction. And I wanted to reread it. I'm, I'm no doubt going to reread you're gonna, it. You're going to get through I'm the gonna, first 10 pages and go, oh. <laughs> I'm undoubtedly going to regret it, but I ordered a copy. Let me grab it. Oh, no. A first edition. Okay, apparently not. Yeah, I remember seeing that. I remember, remember that. Let me read the yeah. back of this here. Tarnsman of Gore is the first novel, the first in a series, John Norman. Its young author is a doctor of philosophic logic who has read little fantasy, but has found that he likes to write in the genre because, like many others, it frees him to explore new ideas, to relax in a world of his own creation and in a, a world of action and high adventure, a world of courage and cruelty and passion and alien customs. Why are we talking about the author? That's a good question. Why aren't I talking about the damn story here? Especially if it's not a known author. Who gives a shit? This is a magnificent world of gore, a planet as strangely populated as threatening 
as beautiful as any you are likely to encounter, because, you know, we encounter other worlds, of course, that's, that's what we do, in the great works of fiction. We predict that the name of John Norman will one day be known among the best. That is not a blurb for a book. That's no, an author quote. <laughs> no, the fact that you haven't said anything about the book scares me. At the top of the book here, it says, Valentine Books is proud to present, for the very first time, the original account of the adventures of Tarl Cabot, sometimes a minor lecturer on Earth, designated to become a fiery fighting Tarnsman on the planet Gore, also known as Counter-Earth. Okay. If he's if he's a lecturer, obviously John Norman, the uh, doctor of, of philosophy, was, you know, writing some Mary Sue Mary shit. Sue, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's bad. Uh, obviously, please, please, please do not ever write any blurbs <laughs> that are anywhere close to that, folks. Nowhere close. I mean, that sounds like Valentine bought like 20 of the books from him when we're trying to launch the series. That's what it sounds like. Who knows? It's not a very thick book. It's not a whole lot of pages in here. No, they look like the um, the men's adventure. What do they call them? It's about 220 pages of small stuff. It's like it's like uh, Doc Savage size. Yeah, yeah, books. yeah. So you're talking about maybe 50,000 at the max. Maybe so. Interesting. God. When was it written down? I'm curious. It says 75 cents on the cover, so you got to know it's been a while. Yeah, just a little while. And this is a this is the original. It's not a reprint. Oh wow, you dig that first? It says the first edition. Here. And it is copywritten, 1966 December first edition. Wow. How the hell? And did if you anyone has, I I ordered it off of um, ABE Books. Okay. So I just looked for one that was fairly inexpensive and had a decent quality to it because I didn't want it to fall apart on me. Now you but just it, it makes go ahead. Now you just have to find the courage to read it again. <laughs> I know. I'm a huge fan of E.E. E. Doc Smith from my memory of what I had read of his stuff many, many decades ago. But sometimes I, I go back and I try to reread it and I'm like, you can't get past the sexism and the racism and the other isms that are all part of something that was written 80 or a hundred years ago. Their day, what was acceptable in those days is not acceptable now. And I'm not even sure it was acceptable then, but it's what was written and published. Yeah. It's weird to go, go back and look at, uh, you know, some of the books at the time. I remember, I don't remember which Philip K. Dick story it was, but he was talking about the, the Negro Protection Act. But he never explains what the hell that was all about. And it's just kind of like, I always wonder exactly, the context was it was there to keep them from being killed. That was the context. But I'm not really sure what he meant by that. I've, I've kind of always wondered. It's one of those things I need to research at some point you or probably don't want to know the probably answer. don't but i kind of do i just uh uh i kind of do but yeah there there's some things where you you see something or read something mentioned in fiction or, or there's a certain scene and you're just kind of like what the hell was really going on there what was the author trying to say what was their subconscious trying to say was it trying to say anything and i were just at a weird moment or was there something else that was going on there that we didn't know about the world was a different place when they were writing. Oh, yeah. There's no excuses for, you know, I'm not trying to compare today with back then. But they had a different foundation that they were basing their stories upon. We project our own current events into our fiction. That's what happens with everybody. Not me. Thankfully, thankfully these days, we can have strong female characters we don't have to slam anybody because of where they're from. We can we can be beyond that. But I'm sure that in 50 years, somebody will look back at something we've written and go, those, those losers. Are you kidding? That happens every time I publish. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> 
No, I, gosh, I keep going back to wanting to reread the Skylark series by Doc Smith, and the women aren't even cardboard cutouts. They're how can you go lower than cardboard cutouts? They are memes. The women are memes. So James Bond without the talking. The women are the perpetually helpless, screaming at danger, can't really accomplish anything sort of people. All the stereotypes, all the negative stereotypes of women are right there. They have a, a manservant, Shiro. He's from Japan. And as you might imagine, he's treated like an idiot. Well, maybe maybe not an idiot, but they certainly start off with the accent making him sound like an idiot. Oh, so they actually write the pigeon yes. English? Oh, yes, they God. do. Yes, he did. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's bad. That is bad. <laughs> it was written in the 1920s, 1920s and 30s when it started out. So it is not shocking to me that this is the case. But rest assured, dear listeners, that um, that uh, times have changed. Where was he Please from? Please don't ever do, do that. I don't. Not off the top of my head. Hmm. I'm just, uh, I'm curious now. American food engineer specializing in donut and pastry mixes. I'm thinking that's not E.E. E. Doc Smith. Uh, yeah. Better known by his pen name, E.E. E. Doc Smith. Edward huh. Elmer Smith. Well, at least you could say they're donuts. Uh, Spokane, Washington. And Idaho and Michigan. All right, all over the place. Interesting. Okay. A food engineer. What the hell is a food engineer? Is that a cook? Specializing in donuts and pastries? It sounds like a chef. It sort of kind of does. I don't know. That's I like honestly have no idea. I never researched that part of existence. I found him as an author when I was in middle school. So I didn't have the discerning taste to know everything that was wrong with what he was writing. But even back in the seventies, the late seventies, even I was going, dude, you need to lighten up a little bit here, man. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like going back and watching blazing saddles. It's uncomfortable. Blazing Saddles? I'm going to differ with you around this. Blazing Saddles was meant to be provocative. Oh, it was. It, it was. wasn't it just, something... It hurts. It wasn't something that was written because it was a different time. It was intentionally written to be in your face about it. Yeah, it was satire. It was satire, parody, and, and social commentary in a big, big way. And it was... It was comedy as well, because nowadays comedians have trouble with telling jokes about certain things because people are offended. People were offended back then, too, but it wasn't, you know, a world stopping event. Here's the thing about humor. When you tell a joke, somebody is the butt of it. No matter what the kind of humor it is somebody comes out on the short end of the stick. But now there is like this, this crowd of people with pitchforks and, and torches that will burn your comedic career to the ground if they think that you are mocking their particular protected group. Yeah. And that's not, that's not how comedy works. Comedy is something that mocks everything and everyone. I think it's a question of stereotypes and whether or not people are believing that. I knew I knew some Indians who just wished that Apu from South from the Simpsons would just die a horrible death because it offended them so much. And yet, and yet, I have been to that convenience store a thousand times. 
if you know what I mean. So it, it's 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 one of those things where it's like, yes, I know it's a stereotype, and yes, I know it's awful to think in those terms, but there are times when I've walked into that store. Few and fewer as I've gotten older, but I remember in the 80s, it was like that at the 7-Eleven. Every time you walk in there. So I, that, it, it's one of those things that's really hard to pin down exactly, you know, what you're supposed to do with that. On Netflix, Dave Chappelle has a new special, which I, I forget the name of, but it's not that he has changed. He, he came out swinging, doing the same type of comedy that he has always done, taking whoever is the most convenient target and lampooning them. And he did not allow himself to be discouraged from taking aim at the groups that were going to get after it. He just went along and did the same type of comedy routine he did. On Netflix, the critics are on a Flickster or whatever, the, the review site for this, Rotten Tomatoes. The um, critics have it down in the 30s, and the people that have watched it have it at 99 <laughs> and I think that's telling. Uh, maybe. I watched the show because I said, okay, I've got to see what this is all about. And yeah, he goes after everybody and it seems to make a specific point about going after the people that are most offended. And I thought it was funny. Of course you did, because you're warped and sick and wrong. I you agree know, with that. The main reason is we love you. But my sense of humor is different than a lot of people's, because shit, I could I could watch a celebrity roast nowadays. Actually, I can't, because it's nothing but dick jokes. And I don't care. I remember watching back in the day when they were doing these and they were classy. They could still rip the skin off somebody and do it in a classy way. Not anymore. Humor is all so primitive. Oh, my God. What? I, I, I'm trying to think of all the people in the 60s who said that about Carlin and Klein and uh, um, et cetera. Carlin had intelligence. He didn't have yes, to. Did. Well, I'm sure he, I'm sure he tells dick jokes. Oh, too, he but... tells all sorts of all sorts of lowbrow humor mixed with highbrow humor. But you know, you've also got the the stuff they well, the did. Brow has, a more the brow has the brow has gotten a lot lower as time went on. I'm just saying. Next thing I'm going to hear, all oh, them long hair, tattoo, piercing youngins ain't good for shit. Actually, I think that that particular group is just fine. <laughs> it's Andy Dick and people like him that are the problem. Well, Andy Dick's a problem anyway. Didn't he get his lights punched out somewhere? I, I don't know. I don't read up on that bullshit. I have no idea. Not a clue. There's no telling. But in any case, we've, we've wandered down a, a rabbit hole on this. Times change. What people find tolerable changes as we go along to as the population ages out what is tolerable in fiction is going to also change so who knows what the audience is going to look like in 30 years and is that something you worry about terry i don't i don't either i don't either the only thing i, I write the stories that appeal to me and all the old folks like me read them the, the only thing I worry about is making some crazy theory and having it proven absolutely false the next year after I publish the book. <laughs> but I know it's inevitable, and I know there's nothing I can do about it, and it it may be the base of the story, but et cetera, et cetera, ad infinitum. Uh, that's the only worry, that I'll, I'll look like an ass, complete ass. But At least you're not as bad as the guy that was writing a post-apocalyptic fantasy novel in the in the modern world and after he had turned the manuscript in 9-11 happened and the the twin towers were a major part of the novel that he wrote and he had to figure out what do i do <laughs> what do i do move everything to the um uh, empire state building 
wouldn't work. He talked about that in the afterward. It was hang gliding. He needed height. Ah. It didn't happen. Because he had to hang glide from the Twin Towers to another building, which I think may have actually been the um, the, Empire, the State. Empire State Building. It's been too long. I don't remember the details. And the story was done. It was off with the editors when this happened. And he was trapped in this place going, do I change the book? Do I just let it go? What do I do? And he eventually decided, leave it. The story's done. Let it go. Hmm. And how was that received? I don't think anybody cared. It's 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 one of those odd things. You, you can make all these premises about what will be going on in the future of some uh, country, and then you know, thirty days later, everything changes. Everything changes that you have based uh, a plot on. All these things can happen and tumble very, very quickly, and and uh, then you're left thinking, "The hell was I? What the hell was I doing? I predicted this, that, and the other. What, does it really matter? Can it just be an alternate reality and you to run with it? It can be, and most people should just run with that. And you know, the 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 shrug is always okay if if you don't know how something happened or came to be, then don't address it. Just say, this is the way it is, and don't explain it. Just go. <laughs> that lead part of your book where it says, all the events are fictional. <laughs> Very important. When I reread uh, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, he had this big, big forward to it about how, uh, you know, back when he wrote this, he believed in telep telepathy and, and uh, et cetera, telekinesis and whatnot. And how his uh, opinions have changed over time and yada, yada, and science has borne this out. It was a good probably 20 pages to what is not a really long book. It was almost like I begged forgiveness for the content of this because I was in a different place. I was like, it doesn't freaking matter. It's fiction. And it was based on some scientific theories at the time. I think you're fine. We've discussed this before because there have been stories portraying venus as you know cloud covered jungle, jungle. <laughs> and once it became known that that's not what it was there were still stories in the pipeline that that portrayed it as something different and there was a lot of consternation among the people that were publishing that at the time of what do i do and then just publish it there's nothing you can do the story yeah like you said the story is there you're you're done you're done at that point. You've there's not much you can do. <laughs> Personally, I'm not convinced that we should, you know, write Venus as the way it is. I think we should go back to saying it's a jungle planet. It's much more entertaining. Uh the Russians supposedly sent two probes there, and there are pictures of what it looks like maybe, down there. Maybe it's a lie. I think the first probe lasted 16 minutes and the other one 19, something like that. It's pretty ugly when you're down on a surface that's hot enough to melt lead. Not to mention all the hydrochloric acid in the air and all the other good stuff. Yeah. Those drones didn't last long. <laughs> Still, it looked like it looked like what you imagine hell looks like. Except it was dark and it was very, very misty. I don't know. I never looked up to see if that was real or not. I tried to at some point, but gave up trying to find it. You are just going to be stuck with a screamer for the rest of the show, huh? I don't know. She just wants some love. She's purring. Of course she is. She was, she was yelling a whole bunch, so I picked her up. Next, it's the water bottle for screamer. No, next, it's me throwing her out the door. She won't like that either. She won't like that either, but, you know. You got to do what you got to do. This is too cute. So, if, are we talking about a specific subject today, or are we already somehow in the middle of what apparently we're Apparently, we wandered off, because I thought we were just going on, and then you went on a tangent and topic and yada yada. And now it's been like, you know, an hour. <laughs> Obviously, you know, two weeks of us not talking to each other is not helpful. Well, we talked on Friday, let you know. 
That barely cut the mustard, man. I know. I know. My heart was lonesome for some Terry goodness. Somebody on YouTube commented that uh, our show it, it would be our show would be a lot better if there were more cats. This could be arranged. Yeah, I thought I I thought of sending that person exactly that warning because you would have like one on each shoulder, one on top of your head, one bumping against the mic stand, be a whole chorus behind you singing. Yeah, the little old cat lady, that's me. <sighs> We need to look up whoever gave you the cat, the old cat lady uh, starter pack, and they need to be disciplined. I think it was you. It wasn't me. Don't blame. No, 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 no. Don't blame this on me. I had nothing to do about it. So we are moving toward October. Do we want to have a horror show in uh, next month? I think horror we should. suspense. I think we should because we don't give that enough airtime. Give my genre some airtime. All right. Well, maybe I'll I'll try and uh, put some names together for that. That could be fun. That could be fun. Well, I guess we should kind of cut this off. Feels like we haven't even really started. I yet. know it feels very very short. Feels very very short. Hmm. What else could we talk about? Well, let's talk about what we hope to accomplish in the next month or so. Oh, fuck. Sleep. <laughs> you know, that is that is a valid thing. To, that's a valid thing to aim for. You're talking about the rest of September go, or in October? You, you can't. Uh, well, maybe say till the end of October. Next month and a half. It's, it's not like we're projecting so that we can, you know, set goals for ourselves. I'm just saying, we talk about what we've done. Let's talk a little bit about what we hope to do. Finish Trident. Yeah, Finish yeah, Trident. yeah. How many months have I heard that? Oh, man, too many. Too many. It's like, uh, you know, I'm, o- I'm almost over the hump of doing all this technology shit that's been distracting me. And everything could just completely fall apart in October and then leave me going, what have I been doing? I have I didn't spend the year writing, so I have nothing to publish, so I can't make money. Yay. But I'll have money in my pocket from the jobs. But, you know, next month, all of this could fall apart, all of it. Uh, that's, the wine that, lady could run off with the robot guy? <laughs> no, it just means that everything could come to an end. I have no idea. I just know October is, is the rough month for that, so... With that in mind, you know, I've still been whittling away at, at Trident, which I can't make money on, really, but uh, keep my patrons happy, maybe bring in some more patrons, which wouldn't be bad. Um, and I'd sell the audiobook again. Would also feed the podcast eventually. So there's a lot of reasons to want to finish it, plus, I want to get it done and off my plate. So I can go finish up Signal Decay and actually have something I can uh, figure out what to do with. And then write something else. Maybe after that I'll write uh, The Black Extinction or I'll just keep going on on Derelict. Finish off that fifth book. Get her done. Get her done. Get her done. And then I will be free to finish Extinction and then I'll be done. I'll be done trying to to, uh, finish all my Severed Press titles whether or not they'd be published by Sever Press. Finish those two series, clear the boards, and then I can figure out what I'm going to do next. But what I hope to achieve in October, finishing Trident. That's I, a worthy goal. I hope you make it. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> so do I. The good news, bad news, is that since it's not being published, is when it's finally published... I will have been able to clear up any plot holes or add material or fix whatever problems are there. Uh, so I'm not too worried about putting it in front of people because it's not going to be published. This is my laughing at you face. Why is that? It never works out that way. <laughs> it totally never works. I have, this is now bulletproof. Oh, what about this big old plot hole you missed on this? Oh, God. 
damn it. No, ah! I was just saying there's some foreshadowing I can do in the first book about stuff that's happening in four and five. There's a little more foreshadowing I could put in there. Uh, now that, that I know exactly where it's going, there's some things I would like to go back and put drop hints for at the very beginning. It would help because people did not yeah. grab them. So, uh, but all that aside, Trident getting that done will be huge. Uh, cause I think it's going to re- lead right into destruction, but we'll see. But I've also been thinking that, uh, I need to get another short story put out for another anthology. Let's find a, another anthology. See if I can't get one in horror, see if I can't get one, in another science fiction one. And, uh, you know, try and get some of that going. So I do have a backlog of work. I can at least shop if nothing else, because right now the cupboard's pretty goddamn bare. Well, with short fiction, I'd recommend, you know, you, you look around for places that you can publish it. You may want to start with the paying markets. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm talking not the smaller anthologies, but try the big names. Yep. Send it off, let it be rejected, send it off again. If you start building up, writing a story, a short story a month, and you just keep that thing continually in the mail going to places that can publish it before you deal with finding something that's smaller, you might get published and make 500 bucks off the damn thing. True. And the kind of advertising that being published in one of the big magazines brings you, because that's what it is, multi-page advertising, is worth it. The other thing I'm, I'm thinking about more and more is um, uh, just for the shits of it, just going ahead and, and uh, putting the next work out or not putting the next work out, whatever the next work is that I decide that uh, we'll probably do better. If somebody else handles it, then uh, I will probably shop that just for the hell of it. Just to see what happens to a, I, if it's a novel, yep. I absolutely do not recommend you go to any of the big traditional publishers. You'll lose your shit forever. <laughs> Why are you chortling? I just, I knew exactly what was coming. I knew, I knew what was coming. That's all. It's the contracts, man. <laughs> yeah. You're telling me about contracts. Forever. Yeah, I am. Just because, you know, I feel like I need to repeat that, that you need to find a trusted smaller press and get a contract you can live with. I had one of those. No, you didn't. You just didn't realize you didn't. Yeah. Well, we'll be shut of that shit next year so be the end of that it's time to talk to david wood here's this horror novel that i have for you here's this entire black series <laughs> you know i bet he i bet he'd be willing to talk turkey with you i bet the i would bet there's gonna be quite a few people who want to talk turkey to me when i have the rights back to that yes but you know david you know you can always go beat his ass if you need to that's true i know where he lives i know exactly where he lives yeah, regardless. What are you hoping to accomplish by next month? I'm going to finish Ruin Terra, and I'm going to write a 25,000-word novella that I'm going to use as a um, something for the mailing list as a law as a leader, not not a loss leader. There's a word for it. I'm a reader magnet to bring them in to my mailing list. Okay, gotcha. So because free, I really need to have something like that. Free short story? It's not going to be a short story. It's going to be a 25,000 word novella. Just like I said. Okay. Sorry. My, my mind wandered. Yeah. I, the reason I want it to be about 25,000 words is because audible has a limitation of a minimum of two hours. Ah, okay. If I want to have something that I can also have audio with realistically aiming at 25,000 words gives me a teeny bit of cushion I usually end up going long. It'll probably be 30,000. But even if it goes a little bit short, it should still be okay. Unless she talks, she has to talk really slowly. Slow it down, Veronica. Put the brakes on. So yeah. this character really, let, let's make them talk as if they're just really on quaaludes. You know, just, just really slow. I can see this now. She records it and sends me a note. You need an extra chapter. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah. No, I think it'll be fine. 
I, I, I'm not usually one to write short. So if I aim for 20,000 odds are good, it's going to go to 30 and that'll be fine. But it's not going to, it's, it, I has, I, I, I kept wanting to say, I can write something about, you know, the characters in the empire novels before they, but no, I can't because they're not the same people. That just doesn't work. Yeah. That's, that's an issue. Sort of an issue. So I decided that I was going to reach back into the history of time and have their ancestor, Lucian, as a child, when he is shipped away from Terra by his father because the war is about to go badly. His journey to get to Avalon and his arrival. And is, the, the problems that they encountered getting him there. Is that how the Empire got built? That's Jared, how the new Jared Empire got built. Yeah, Jared and Kelsey's Empire. Yeah. He was there 500 years before them. <clears throat> the way it worked was Avalon in the old empire was a uh, vacation world, basically. It was a recreation place. Lots of mountains, lots of things along those lines. And when the Civil War broke out, they got EMP'd. So they got their technology knocked down, but they didn't get invaded. And at the conclusion of that, a uh, small group of ships arrived, including one that had the uh, emperor to be for their new empire on board. All of the ships were destroyed, getting Lucy into the surface of the planet. No Navy people survived that fight, but none of the enemy did either. Hmm. And that part's already written into the story. That's his true. arrival. They've already viewed the, the video of his arrival. They know what happened, but I can tell the story of when he was told on Terra by his father that he had to leave. Correct. And then I can tell the trials and travails of him getting to Avalon and write out the ending of it from his point of view. Okay. That sounds good. And that's what I'm, that's, that sounds like a good reader magnet for me because it's a good lead into the story itself without actually using the characters that are in it. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I like it. Get on that. Oh, another thing I, I, another actually, thing I, know, I hope to do by next that, month. Uh, I don't know that Audible has a two-hour limit because I had a short story done with them. Maybe that's new. I don't know. I was about to say, I don't think Lamash 2 and Mimes are two hours. I think Mimes is only like 45 minutes. I don't know where I, don't know where I heard two hours, but I'm still aiming for 25,000 because I want it to be a novella. I don't want it yeah. to be a short story. Yeah. No, for that, you would need a novella to tell that story and do it justice. Hmm. Okay. The other thing but I hope to my, accomplish that's by my the, next six weeks. The other thing I would like to accomplish by next month is migrating to from MailChimp. <sighs> I'm thinking about, they already raised my, uh, my fee by 10 bucks a month. Yeah. Fuck those guys. But I keep looking at things like mailer light and how much their open rates are lower. I'm not convinced that it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm still on the fence. Hmm. I'm still on the fence. I'll have to think about it. I have so much shit to do. It's ridiculous. At some point I probably will, but I've got, to, I, I think my problems would be fixed if I go to mailer light and have them have a dedicated server for me so that it's not using whatever generic mail servers that they keep getting marked as spam. I'm going to have to do it slowly. I'm going to have to, to, to build up a test list to see how it works out. Yeah. Yeah. With your mailing list, I would definitely do that. Hmm. I don't know. I look forward to re your report at some point. I think what I'll end up doing is I will migrate the current members of my mailing list over to there. And when I make one of the announcements at some point, I'll send it from both saying that I'm sending it from both and say, anyone, if you got one of these two, but not both, send me a shot. Let me know. Yeah. That'd be a good way to do it. I volunteer for tribute. Actually, I, I've got a hundred people on my uh, arc reading list, I'll probably use them as the test guinea pigs for this. Ah, 
Okay, fair enough. It's better than sending it out to 3,000 people and getting overwhelmed by responses. <laughs> yeah, it's always a bad thing. That's always a bad thing. All right, well, take us out of here. All right. Folks, if you would like to tell us to stop rambling and to get on a subject, send us a note at show at deadrobotsociety.com. And, uh, no. <laughs> What's our email address again? Wow, this outro is going so well already. <laughs> it's been so long since I did this. If you would like to tell us just how old and senile Terry is getting, you can send us an email to show at DevRobotSociety.com. You can tweet me at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. You can find us on Facebook at the listeners of the DevRobot Society Facebook group. You can see our ugly mugs at YouTube.com slash DRS podcast. We have to thank our wonderful host, Pod Hoster, for making all 14 bazillion episodes of DRS available for your ear holes. You can support this show and keep it on the air. Dear God, we don't know why you would. At patreon.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get access to exclusive content like live shows, which we need to do this month, and, and uh, unexpurgated shows, mostly unexpurgated. Anyway, uh, that's what's, what happens. And if you're at the $10 level, I read your name. And the names are Andrew Smallwood, J.D. Barker, Aaron Meiser, Jesse Olafina Orca, Veronica Jaguer. Kelson, Isabel, I forgot to change this way too long. Oops, Cushy, Rick, I got nothing, Shaw, Lisa Slack, Nathan Cosby, Cheryl Winters, Tracy Bodine, Devin Lee, Drew Angry Fiesta, Rodan Bernardi, Chris Winder, AJ, or Hanley. Thank you very much, folks. Bye. <laughs> See how hard that was? Are you proud of yourself? <laughs> I was going to get there. I've only hosted like the last 14 of these damn things. Oh so, you my know, God. I was having to work my way into the right frame oh of mind. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I should just record that piece and play it at the end of every show. Uh, oh God, that was awesome. No, what you should do is take the one you just did and speed it up to 1.5 times itself. So like, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty fast. I'm wondering who understood me at the end there because I kind of went crazy. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll try and be better next week. We'll see you. Bye, folks. We will be better next week. We are going to have a dedicated subject, and we're going to just beat it like a drum. I look forward to my head being the uh, drum. That'll be awesome. All right. Goodbye, people. Bye-bye.